In Scotland, proud land of traditions with memories of bitter battles, people talk about human rights for children at school or elsewhere as though they were a given. Today, those rights are taken for granted. But years ago, it was a completely different story. In those days, teachers had absolute power and the right to beat children. Children did as they were told, and if not, the leather belt was there for physical punishment. During the 70s, Grace Campbell, a mother from Glasgow, decided to lead the battle against the belt and against head teachers and the prevailing mentality. She took her case to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and won. The Campbell case made history. The day after the judgment, she declared, I'm very pleased with the outcome of the case and feel that a speedy implementing of the findings will improve the educational environment for both teachers and pupils. I would point out that this was a private case brought to the court without support from any other outside parties. I think obviously the result of the case will benefit all British children. philosophy was quite simple, you just don't hit children. It's that simple. The idea that physical punishment is something to do with discipline is nonsense. It is not synonymous with discipline, it's synonymous with child abuse. End of story. It's that simple. You just don't do it. The Campbells had two sons, Gordon and Andrew. The younger, Andrew, became a lawyer, specialising in human rights. I was about uh, nine years old, I think, when the uh, Strasbourg judgment came out. I don't remember an awful lot about it because my parents very consciously uh, tried to shield us from all that was going on. Um, my brother was a bit more exposed uh, because he was named in the case um, and my mother had asked could the school give an undertaking that my brother would not be uh, subject to corporal punishment um, and the school refused to give that. Um, all my mum wanted was for Gordon and I not to be hit at school um, but in order to, to make that happen um, she had to go to court um, going to court in Scotland um, wasn't really an option because the law in Scotland was really quite clear in the matter that corporal punishment was possible. So uh, my mum had to, to go to court, there being no, no judicial route in, in Scotland or indeed in the UK, the only choice was, was to go to Strasbourg. She'd been fighting for eight years by that time or approximately eight years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it wasn't something that happened overnight. You, it wasn't a simple case of you apply to Strasbourg and they make the judgment. It was far, far more complex than that. And we had to uh, submit all sorts of uh, information. The only thing we made absolutely sure that we never at any time made any statement which was not 100% factually correct. Mm -hmm. And we also never on any occasion approached the press at all because that was also forbidden by the structures, uh, strictures of the court. As a child I certainly picked up on an awful lot of sort of uh, negativity um, to us as a family. Um, we had a teacher from the local school who lived at the bottom of our street and she refused to speak to us for about 20 years, actually. Um, ironically, her son became a primary school teacher and his views were the exact opposite um, because he hadn't been brought up to use punishment as a, as a tool for education. Um, and 
So it was, it, the local the local situation wasn't great. I, I've seen some correspondence in uh, at home where people were uh, trying to sort of pressure, apply pressure to the family. I remember we came back from a long weekend away and there was graffiti daubed on the front door of the house. Um, and it was made to look like children's handwriting, but it was too well done. And uh, e even as a child of 12, I could tell, you know, that, that wasn't a child's handwriting. Uh, but it was made to look like that. We had bricks through the, through the lounge window. Um, we, we were aware that our telephone was being bugged. The press reaction was totally hostile, as was the attitude of the, the unions, both teaching unions and non-teaching unions, and the government, and the local authority, and virtually everyone we knew. Um, she used to get a lot of stress headaches, um, and she died about three years after the judgment. Um, three, three years after the judgment was final, in 86, and so when the domestic law changed in 86, and I think at, at that point, I, I do vividly remember uh, my parents just feeling like there was a weight off their shoulders, because that really was the last gasp. There was nothing else they had to do. Uh, I think in Grace once counted it, and the total number of people who said thank you was 13. 13 of our friends. But there were a few teachers who believed in the Campbell's fight and formed an association called STOP. Well, uh, I was actually secretary of the uh, STOP Scotland, which was a society of teachers opposed to physical punishment in Scotland. We started off our campaign in Scotland in 1978 um, at a time when the majority of teachers in Scotland, perhaps around about 75% of the teachers in Scotland, wanted to keep uh, physical punishment in Scottish schools, which was the system was the belt, which was administered on the hand. Um, and um, the majority of teachers in Scotland at that time felt that that was necessary to maintain discipline in Scottish schools. We didn't feel that that was necessary. We thought discipline could be uh, maintained in other ways, in non-violent ways. And the basic philosophy of the Ban the Belt campaign was that if you, so long as you have physical punishment in the schools, then you're teaching the message that violence is a way to solve problems, not just in schools, but in society. And so therefore, uh, if there are problems in society as a whole, a lot of uh, violence, a lot of murder, a lot of mayhem, then the schools may, may have be to some extent responsible for that. And so that was the main driving force behind our campaign. I think a human rights approach leads to respecting people. And it's about respecting everybody in this case involved in education and schools. So it's children's rights, but it's also recognizing that teachers and other staff and parents all have human rights. But what I think is so valuable is when you put that lens on in terms of considering children, is you realize that children should be and are deserving of respect. You know, again, they're not these empty vessels that perhaps traditionally might have been thought that will just fill them up <laughs> with all good learning and discipline them. You know, and hopefully they'll come out of that as, as the adults we want. But I think, again, realizing that children are people, um, that their rights need to be respected. And that's actually the society that we should and want to be in. So, yes, I'm a firm promoter of children's rights. I would say it's difficult to, to convey that now, but at the time, teachers in Scotland particularly, very, very well respected. Um, society looked up to teachers. Whatever a teacher said was taken as gospel truth. Um, so if they said they couldn't teach without use of corporal punishment, then obviously that was true. It had always been recognised in Scotland that teachers have a, a special role in the development of children, and it was it was assumed for hundreds of years that that involved that included um, punishment if the children were were bad in some way or naughty or had done something wrong. Um, but of course, what what is legitimate punishment and illegitimate punishment is is always was open open to debate. The uh, the the traditional Scottish means of of physical punishment was, was, was the belt, you know, a big, a big leather strap, and you would put your hands out like this, mm -hmm. two hands, and the teacher would...
put down the belt on your on your hand. And when I was at school, this was in the 60s and 70s, this was very common. You know, would, somebody would get, get the belt every day. If you take the population as a whole, um, people are slow to change their deeply held, deeply rooted prejudices. And unfortunately in Scotland and indeed in England too, there was this long-standing belief that corporal punishment was part of the educational process. And to some extent, the older generation, you still say, when they, when they read in the papers about uh, teenagers misbehaving, for instance, they'll say, oh yes, time they brought back the belt. You know, <laughs> I mean, but but uh, among teachers, I would say, among, I, I would say that is now a minority view, and I think there, there's no, there are very few people in, within the teaching profession today. And I'm retired now, but, but uh, uh, from what I, I I hear and read in the newspapers, very few official teachers would want to bring back the bell. After the court's judgment, children's human rights in Scotland were no longer questioned. And I'm struck when reading the judgment now that, that actually the case was really quite uh, surprising to have won in many ways um, because there were quite a lot of arguments that the government had, had raised um, and which even the court's own previous decisions would have led you to believe that the case would have been thrown out. Um, but I think uh, I'm, I'm told that the turning point was pretty much when the government said, um, if you take away corporal punishment, then how can we possibly teach our children? Um, and obviously for most of the, the judges in the court, they came from jurisdictions where uh, corporal punishment had been abolished decades and decades before. So it's a fundamental children's rights issue, and that Campbell case really meant that in terms of state schools, you know, corporal punishment was banned in Scotland and indeed elsewhere in the UK. So that's such an achievement. There is an irony that the actual court decision and the, and the way it got into court and the way it was decided is that at its core of it, it was actually decided on the basis of parental rights. It wasn't about the children's philosophical conventions. Um, they didn't win on it being degrading treatment under those particular facts of the case. One of the things that's quite interesting about the case is, is that the court held it was all about parents' rights, not children's rights. It's just the way that the, the, the case ended up. But nevertheless, it, it, it had a profound effect on uh, 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 the position in Scotland because the government immediately had to pass some legislation uh, uh, simply prohibiting all sorts of corporal punishment. On a personal level, the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights into to UK law and Scottish law in particular um, has been, I think, a, an amazingly positive development. Um, it has crystallised something that, that has been there for a long, long time in Scots law, concepts of fairness and doing the right thing. Um, but it has given it a more, uh, a, a proper structure. Um, so human rights now is, is mainstream. The decision in Strasbourg uh, had ramifications not only in Britain but uh, in several parts of the world, uh, in particular Australia, New Zealand, uh, America. If you believe strongly in something, you have to do something about it. I mean, you can't sit back and expect someone else to do it. I'm sorry, it's that simple. <laughs>